Well, good morning. It's interesting as uh, we worshiped hearing the sound of the rain and thunder. I thought I heard a few times. It reminded me of a time a few years back. I was invited to, to preach at another congregation on a Wednesday night. It was out in the central part of, of West Virginia. Similar kind of weather. Um, and I can't remember exactly the topic, and I'm sure they don't either, but... Um, I remember in, in the lesson, I was, to, uh, I was going to mention Jesus' statement that as, as, as lightning flashes from one end of heaven to the other, um, and he was talking about his coming, what his coming would be like, and when I got to that part, apparently a thunderclap hit really loud outside and the lights went out. At that moment, and I thought, wow. If they don't respond to this invitation, you know. But hopefully nothing that dramatic will happen this morning. But we are glad to, to uh, see everybody and to be here. Um, you may not be familiar with the name Bobby Dodd, unless you've been a, a big, big-time college football fan for a long time. But Dodd was a former coach, uh, great coach at Georgia Tech. And then one time... His team was leading a very close game, 7-6, to six, just a minute to go in the game. And he told his quarterback very clearly not to pass the ball under any circumstances. He said, whatever you do, hold on to that football. Do not pass the ball. Well, in the next 10 or 15 seconds of play, they, they had moved the ball down to the field to within just a few yards of the opposing team's goal line. And as the, the quarterback began to execute the next play, just you know, t seconds in the game ticking away, he couldn't resist, and he threw a pass. And as feared, that pass was intercepted by a player on the other team, and, and the opponent raced toward Georgia Tech's goal line at the other end of the field. The entire team chased for a while, but they had given up the chase, except for the quarterback who had thrown the pass. And he, he continued to, to run as hard as he could after the interceptor and somehow was able to catch him and to tackle him and to jar the ball loose. The uh, ball was fumbled and, and the quarterback who had thrown the interception recovered it uh, to save the game for his team. Well, Georgia Tech won seven to six. And after the game, the losing coach came to Coach Dodd and he said, I will never understand how that quarterback was able to do what he did. And Dodd explained as follows. He said, well, it's actually quite simple. Your player was running for a touchdown. My guy was running for his life. <laughs> so yes, uh, two people running in the same direction, but with completely different motivations. And motivation can make all the difference, can it not? I'd like to read a passage with you this morning from 1 Timothy chapter 1. Let's just begin with uh, verse 1 and read down through verse 7. 1 Timothy 1, 1 through 7. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. 
So when I was reading this opening to 1 Timothy, there was one word in particular that caught my eye. It's in verse 5, and it's the word aim. The aim of our charge, Paul writes. Now other translations say end or goal or purpose. But Paul, Paul says here the aim of our charge is love. The goal was love. The purpose was love. Now, I'd like to take a, a moment or two and just break this down and help us to see what's, what's here for us today. Paul begins his first letter to Timothy with a warning about certain false teachers who were becoming a danger to the church there in Ephesus where, where Timothy was laboring. We're not given a lot of detail about what exactly they were teaching that was false uh, other than it involved myths and, and genealogies, various speculations. Uh, there's a lot of vain talk, Paul says, and, and a lack of understanding. It seems that these false teachers speak very confidently, but they really don't understand what they're saying. This is about the extent of, of our knowledge of what, what they were doing. And Paul wants Timothy, this early leader among these Ephesian churches, to speak out against this, against this false doctrine, to charge certain people not to espouse it any longer, to basically stop their mouths uh, before any lasting damage can be done. That's always needed when false teaching raises its ugly head in the church. It needs to be stopped. It is a threat. But Paul does more than just make Timothy sort of his long distance hitman on false teachers. He does more than, than simply have Timothy make some people shut up. Paul gives Timothy motivation. And he tells Timothy really the reason for doing this. He gives him the aim, in other words, the goal, the purpose of doing this. And that part, folks, must never be forgotten, the aim. Why should we take a stand for truth? Why challenge false teaching that might arise? Why correct someone? Why rebuke someone? Just because it's fun, you know, to confront? Um, through the years, I've come across some people who, who seem to enjoy rebuking more than anything else in, in the Christian life. That is never healthy. Should, should one do it because they just like to show how right they are and how wrong the other person is? That is sick. The Spirit of God is not in that, you see. So why do it? Why, Paul, should we do this? Why get after these false teachers in Ephesus? Why challenge them? Why correct them? Why discipline them? Again, look at verse 5. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So the goal... The aim that, that Paul gave Timothy in his challenge of this false teaching was love. That was where he wanted this entire thing to end up, love. This Christian love, this agape, that's the motivation. That was where it was all supposed to come out, you see. Better love. Increased agape love. But in case that wasn't specific enough, Paul tells Timothy where that kind of love comes from. What is it that contributes to increased Christian love among God's people? Paul says it comes from three primary sources. If you notice in the, this verse, number one, it issues from a pure heart, a cleansed heart. The kind of heart that Jesus said would allow people to see God 
right? You remember that? In his great sermon, blessed are the pure in heart for what? They shall see God. It's in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. An impure heart cannot be full of the love of God. You're only going to get this kind of love, this agape, from a pure heart. And so Paul tells Timothy here that, that part of the motivation in confronting these false teachers is to get their hearts to change, for them to be cleaned up. There's a concern for them. In fact, for all the Christians in Ephesus to, to, to have pure hearts, that, that's a big part of the goal, including Timothy. The aim of what the apostles taught, men like Paul, the goal, the purpose, is to create clean hearts, pure hearts in people, to purify people. The false teachers had a heart problem that needed to be corrected. That's what Paul points out here. Timothy needed for himself to make sure he didn't have one too. See? As the confronter, as the rebuker, he he needed to make sure that, that he didn't have a heart problem. It does no good for one impure heart to attack and try to rebuke another impure heart, does it? No. The aim, the goal of it all, is love that issues from a pure heart. Number two, this love is the result of a good conscience. Paul writes, um, and and I sort of wish we we had more time to talk about this because it's sort of a fascinating study. What scripture says about conscience. Talks about conscience quite a bit. The word here literally means with knowledge. With knowledge. And what it implies is that a good conscience is something that is developed over time with others in a community of believers. We often think of conscience as something personal to us. I've got mine, you've got yours. But in Scripture, it's, it's, it's this community thing. It comes from working together. It comes from the training of the Word of God. A good conscience is good because it's been trained by God's word to be good. And and you learn it with others. It's with knowledge. It's not a completely individualized thing. Like, Like we often think. Points out part of the reason why it's so important that we get together in the word. That's not a legalistic requirement. It's... It's part of building us, building in us a scriptural conscience. And so you can see how how something like that would contribute to love. A good conscience is something you learn along with others whom you love, other believers. Together you learn what's right and what's wrong and how to respond to situations in life that come up and, and how to react You work with others on your own conscience. And in so doing, love increases. The false teachers were sort of out on their own, doing their own thing, you see. And and they had separated in some way from the faith community, and they're, they're sort of calling others to come join them. That's often the case with false teaching. They needed corrected so they could get back, be part of the family again, where good consciences are trained. The aim, the goal was love from a pure heart and a good conscience. The third part, this this love issued from a sincere faith. So pure heart, Good conscience, sincere faith. Three important elements that lead to genuine agape love among brethren. 
But what's he mean by sincere faith? Uh, well, it's genuine. It's the real thing. Uh, it is, the older translations say, unfeigned. That's not a word we use much. Unfeigned faith. Uh, it's unfaked. Okay? It's the real article. Too often, among false teachers, and even among those who fancy themselves as great warriors against false teachers, there is questionable faith. There's an issue about how genuine the faith is, how sincere it is. Are they really people of great faith who produce the fruit of the Spirit in their lives? Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, all those traits that are supposed to be building in us? Are they really people doing that? Or are they just talented at attacking people in error? There's a big difference, according to the Apostle. The Apostle says there needs to be this sincerity of faith. really appreciate the insight I got from one scholar on this that I read when I prepared this, um, Dr. Michael Moss, um, who I worked for and with in West Virginia, wrote a commentary on 1 Timothy. On this text, he says the word behind sincere could really be rendered unhypocritical. And that helps me understand what Paul's referring to here. Unhypocritical faith. Not a faith that just points out others' mistakes and errors and never really corrects its own, but real faith. Genuine, sincere. That's the goal. The aim, Paul says. And it's important to share that aim. In our attempts to live for God in the church today, it's important to share that aim. If, if you have the wrong goal, if you have the wrong end, the wrong aim, you can do a lot of unintended damage to people. If you're not careful how you aim. There was a young farm boy... He had bought some archery equipment. Couldn't wait to try it out. And, and he knew that, that hay bales would be the best backdrop for a target, but for whatever reason at the time, it, there was none available, and so he chose to use what he had. What he had was several sheets of insulation board that were leaning against an old outbuilding and he thought that would provide the perfect substitute for the hay bales and took his target. He centered the target over the boards, stepped off the required distance to practice shooting. He, he strung the bow. He carefully fitted an arrow onto the bowstring. He, he drew the arrow and he fired. And the arrow struck the target and even though it did, there was this instantaneous sound of breaking glass, which was the first indication that the, the target area might not have been a good choice. In the springtime, however, it had seemed the very best place to stack all 20 of the storm windows from the house. The arrow had passed through the bullseye of the target, had passed through the insulation boards, and then through the entire stack of glass windows, breaking every single one of them. It's possible, folks, to hit the target we've set up and still do a lot of unintended damage. Because our aim was not what it should have been. Our motivation was off. 
Here, the Apostle Paul gives us the proper motivation. The aim of our charge is what? Love. The aim of our charge is love, which issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Let's bow. Holy Father, thank you for your day, the honor of being able to assemble with people that we love and we share faith with, and help us to heed your word and help our aim to truly be love. Thank you for our Savior and what he has done for us, the, the excellent way we've been reminded of his work for us today as we celebrated the Lord's Supper. Help us to go forth from here, uh, build up and strengthened and ready to share good news with others so others can come to know you. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Thank you this morning for being a part of our assembly and listening. We're going to stand uh, with Mike as he comes. And, and if you need to respond in some way, asking for help, for prayer, if you need to obey the gospel of Jesus this morning, we would love to see you baptized into Christ. Whatever we can do to help you, please let us know. While together we stand.